All right, dude. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. Welcome to the Philosophers and Poets Podcast. I'm Abe, a part-time preacher and freelancer. And I'm Sam, a PhD student, preacher, and part-time healthcare executive. And we respect the great tradition. We're also brothers. Each week, we'll take a topic or author in the great tradition and explore their ideas for their own sake and how Christians can benefit from them. If you're someone who loves philosophy, old books, ancient ideas, and God, you should subscribe. Today, in our first podcast, we're going to discuss the great tradition in and of itself. Sometimes we refer to this as the great tradition, um, the great conversation, uh, the great books of the Western world. There's a number of names as far as what exactly this is. So we have uh, a lot of time in our hands compared to the ancients in which they spent most of their time working all the time. But today, because of culture and because of the advancements, we have a lot of leisure. So one of the things we want to be do, do as good students of our time is to be uh, engaged with things that are worthwhile. Now, Solomon, in all of his wisdom, says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 12, My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making books there is no end, and of much study is the weariness of the flesh. So we want to spend time doing things that are worthwhile, and Sam and I, both of us, agree that the Great Conversation is worthwhile. So what exactly is the Great Conversation? So Sam, what is this? What, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so I I am going to define it um, probably differently than other people. I consider the Great Conversation being the discussion about uh, the human condition and God, I would probably start this conversation starting with Homer, uh, the Iliad and Odyssey, and it it pretty much goes up until today. Um, however, I would say that older books, um, you know, anything uh, beyond 100 years ago, um, that's really going to be involved in the conversation. There are some contemporary people who are engaged in this conversation, and they have significant contributions to it, but we normally... At least I do. I normally think about um, a lot of older books when we think about the great tradition or the the great conversation of the great tradition. Yeah, we can use either of those kind of interchangeably there. Yeah, it, this is a hard question to really define, just like all big questions in life. But there's some things that we at least have to include, like, you know, Sam starts off with Homer as being somebody that you have to include and you have to include Homer. Uh, he was, in a sense, the Bible of the ancient uh, Greeks, just as Virgil was, uh, the Aeneid was like the ancient Bible of the, the Romans. And there's these texts that stay with us for such a long time. And what makes these texts important is because they have a dialogue with one another. Um, you know, Aristotle references Plato, and then those after Aristotle reference him, and on and on, and they have this conversation going on about these big ideas, what it means to be a human being, what it means to be ethical, uh, what it means to live the good life, and what it means to run a city well. Those are some big ideas there, but also, as later on as Christians came along and really took up this discourse, they included Christian ideas with it. What does it mean um, to love, and what is God like? And so they would uh, write about these things and, and bring them so that other people could read them. And what makes them part of the great conversation most likely is, one, their uh, books that have stood the test of time. And uh, there are books that you can reread several times over and get something new with them out of them every single time. Like I've read Plato's Republic, uh, I don't know how many times now, but a few times, four, maybe five times. And each time I read that book, I come back to it thinking, my goodness gracious, um, did I read this last time? <laughs> I, I there's, there's something there for me to, to gain out of it. And that to me, what makes a great book really good is you come back to it and you, you learn more things than what you thought you did. And you just, you almost, it's almost like you see that book everywhere. I, that, to me, that's that what makes it part of the great conversation. Quick question, Abe, would you, would you consider the Bible as a great book? So would, would it be I, a part of the, I don't know if we want to call it the canon, but is, yeah. is it a part of the great books or is it in its own category? Or is that an either-or proposition? Yeah, I, I'm not sure yet. But I think 
it needs to belong in its own set of canon as the Bible is its own canon. And so we have to kind of set that off itself. But it's also part of the conversation because um, a lot of what the ancients would uh, into it on their own um, is part of what the Bible would say. And even the Bible sometimes is like a reaction to what the ancients were saying about certain things. And so that's worthwhile. So it's definitely part of it, but it's not um, – it's on its own pedestal, I think. We have to, we have to separate it to some degree with it. But I think it's a, it's a worthwhile question for us. But maybe we'll spend a whole podcast on it in a future date. But for now, I think that's worthwhile. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, no, I, I would say that it's different. Um, I think that Scripture is, is really the, the best book. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put it in with this great conversation. I think that it's, um, this great conversation is human men trying to grapple with, or, you know, they're, they're trying to wrestle with the human condition, who God is from a man's perspective, where the Bible is God revealing himself to us. And it's authoritative where this great conversation is just a bunch of geniuses who talk in a very a uh, profound way, but they themselves are not authoritative. Um, they are uh, just just very intelligent men who can pull us up to their level uh, if we yeah read them uh, many times. So, is there a difference between authoritative and authoritative? Or I don't know. Oh, what okay. did what did I say? You said authoritative. I was like, okay. Oh, I don't know. Maybe all this great learning. Nope. Has, nope. Uh, Gave you some new words to say. It's the Samism, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's all right. We'll we'll probably have plenty of those at some point here. So when it comes to um, the great tradition, obviously there's a, a medium that has to be involved here, and the medium would be books. So um, it's not YouTube videos. Uh, it's not podcasts. Uh, it's it's not anything except for books or even some plays we have to include. But those are written down for us. What we needed to define is what are these great books? They don't have their own saying, well, this is part of the Western canon on every single book that's part of it. A lot of times we won't know actually till much later. So, Sam, what do you think? Uh, how, how do we judge to see what is part of the canon of the Western tradition and what is not? What is a part of the Western tradition or the Western, uh, the great books of the Western world would be older books, as I understand it, uh, books that are talking about significant. Uh, humane topics uh, such as the human condition, you know, who is God, how do you run a city, um, how do you live. Uh, and these books are not going to be distillations of an, another book. So uh, C.S. Lewis talks about in his essay on the reading of old books how today when a young student wants to learn something about, let's say, Platonism or, or you know, Plato, what, what he would do or what maybe a, a, an instructor or a tutor would tell him is, hey, go read this uh, introduction to Plato. And that, uh, that introduction would not be a, a great book. Great books are the books themselves, and also James Shaw talks about this is not maybe a, 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 the great books of the Western world, but just what makes a great book is a book that alters your perspective, and you can um, – now James Shaw is, is a little bit, I guess, I'm not sure if antagonistic is the right term, but he is in his own um, – he has some ideas that others, I think Mordman Adler, would disagree with, but he would say that you can learn something about the human condition just by looking at a matchbox, just by watching sports, just by doing certain things. Now, watching sports wouldn't be a great book, but other literature that helps you understand yourself and understand others, that would be categorized as great. Um, but I don't think he would say that that's a great book of the Western world, but that is a great book, and that's the book kind of we need to focus on. So I would say they're older books. They're, they're about deeper subjects. They are, the, they are books by the writers themselves, and they, they alter your perspective. Yeah, I think those are all good ways of thinking through it. Yeah, Shaw seems to be like a, a very 
almost mystical like character, you know, anything that alters your perspective, I think really opens the door to just about anything, you know. Um, but I think it's worth worthwhile to considering, but I don't I haven't read his entire argument on the thing, so I really shouldn't say say too much on whether I agree or disagree with that sort of thing. And I probably but, need yeah, to go so, back and read his article to make sure that I'm not um construing his argument in a in an odd way. But he he generally thinks that we need to have leisure in order to think deeply about the very simple things in life and um some literature that we wouldn't classify as great, he would c classify as great because for him, they have changed his perspective uh, in, in a great way. But I, I do probably need to go back and read him and, and see what his main argument is in that essay. Yeah. To me, it's just it introduces a lot of subjectivity to the point which we can't have a conversation because it's so much so that it's it's all the books that you believe alter your perspective and it's all the books that i believe alter my perspective but the idea of this is a conversation where we can agree upon what these books are but well yeah so, i think it's, it's probably but, too much to, to talk about but yeah and I, I know we need to keep on talking but what if someone were to read plato and they were i guess i'm thinking through this and they were not getting anything from reading the republic um, but yet when they read something else, they, it helped them. They, they realized, um, who they were in, in a greater way and they couldn't get it from Plato's Republic because perhaps they just weren't in, in that mindset where they could, uh, receive that. So I would say that, that would be a great book f for them. Um, I but... would just say, go back and read it again. Um, okay. When it comes to Plato's Republic, I, I think it. That one in particular is a hard one to like say, oh, I didn't get anything out of it. You know, maybe if like reading Nietzsche or um, some of Rousseau, even, um, or even like, uh, I don't know. But yeah, I see what, I see what you mean. There, yeah. There's definitely, there's definitely give in this uh, idea here about the great books of the Western world that we're not going to be able to say all the things that are in and are out of it. But we have like this kind of criteria. And I think what you said was good. Old books um, and, and deep books, but also books that, that talk to each other. I think uh, Adler has this quote here about what binds authors together in an intellectual community is the great conversation in which they are engaged. Uh, and the works that come later is a sequence of years. Uh, we find authors listening to what their predecessors have to say about this idea or that or this topic or that. They not only hearken to what their thought, uh, the, to the thought of their predecessors, they also respond to it by commenting it on a variety of ways. So in some sense, it's like the academic community. What makes an academic community work is, you know, you write a paper on a particular idea, and then someone else comes later on, cites you, and develops your idea third further, or it challenges it saying, here's where you're wrong. And that continues on with this um, generating of knowledge and of ideas and how to think through things. Um, I think that's a, a great uh, way of, of thinking through the great books of the world because it has been happening for several thousands of years. And we get to join into that by just reading them or even writing those books themselves if we're so inclined to do so. So I think that's really important on all fronts here. And I think a Christian. Uh, particularly those raised and learned to be, I guess the right word would be fundamentalist in their thinking. Or maybe, I don't want to use the word fundamentalist or simplistic, because that seems like it's not uh, valid. But I think there's some truth to it. But let's say someone comes along, Sam, and realizes that you're getting your whole PhD at, a, at, a, at an institution, and they realize it's in the humanities. It's, you know, it's a liberal arts degree. And uh, they make fun of you saying, oh, wow, I guess you want to be a, a barista your whole life, huh? Um, what, what would you say to that sort of uh, comment or, you know, the question of why in the world would you do this? Why would you get a degree in this? Yeah, I'm even thinking about your previous comment or the, the quote by Adler. He talks about the intellectual community. Uh, is uh, the great conversation in which they are engaged. So he's talking about people talking about something 
in that quote, he doesn't actually talk about what these intellectual communities are talking about. What I think the subject matter is about what the subject matter is of the great conversation is reality. And Christians are interested in reality. You know, what is true? What corresponds to reality? Um, so I think that Christians should be in, interested in, in what is. And because if God created the world, what what is? And um, so we want to be engaged knowing what is true. I do want to say I've had that had people, you know, challenge me on my education. And I think that I, I kind of know where others are coming from. I will say that I am a baptized believer. I, my goal in life is to glorify God. And I, I believe the Bible is sufficient and necessary, um, is the sufficient and the necessary text to help me glorify God. Um, Second Peter 1, 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness uh, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So through his divine power, which is Christ and, and God, through th their, you know, through the gospels, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Um, so why would we be interested in a great tradition beyond that? Uh, I do think that tradition itself is in uh, inevitable. It, it, you can't avoid it. Uh, it's inevitable, I guess. You, you can't avoid it. And I don't think you should try to avoid tradition. And therefore, I think that, you know, you should care about the best kinds of tradition. And obviously, the great tradition would be the best one to be con to concern yourself with. Also, also, those people who say, you know, why, why do you read anything else? Why don't you just read the Bible? Um, I would ask them, you know, well, what, what do they read? Do they read emails? Do they read Fox News? Do they new read novels? Um, do they read cereal boxes? Uh, you know, what, what exactly are they reading and what's wrong with me trying to be interested in reality and how other people believe reality to be? Um, so I, I do know that people are cr uh, critical of me. Also, those people that tell me, you know, only read the Bible, they themselves ask their preachers, you know, what, what, what they think about scripture. So I don't know why they're asking their, their preachers or the church bulletin or the brotherhood articles, church work workbooks. I mean, th these are all things that are not, I guess, in the quote unquote great tradition, but they are in a tradition. And even some of those periodicals are not great. Sometimes they're not that thoughtful and they are not even commenting on what is so i think that the great tradition has lasted for thousands of years and it, it it will allow us to reflect on the word of god his inspired word and and glorify him through that yeah uh, yeah that's that's really important um with like you were saying you read sermons or listen to sermons and you do other things besides the bible itself and um in a way reading the great tradition is like what if you could go back in time and have a conversation with a believer about anything? You know, what if you could do that? Would you do that? It's like, yeah, you know, Thomas Aquinas in his either his Contra Gentiles or his Summa Theologica, um, he commented about everything under the sun when it comes to uh, Christianity. And that's worthwhile reading for in and of itself. Um, just as much as it's reading a, a sermon by by somebody or list, or reading a commentary or a devotional book on those things. And God uh, has not only revealed himself with special revelation that is the word of God, but he's also revealed himself with general revelation. And a lot of times what these books are commenting on is what you were saying as far as reality, but that general revelation of God um, and dealing with humans in and of itself. And so if you're somebody who's interested in humans, as Christian needs to be, then this is something you should be uh, interested in as well. Um, there's, a, there's a comment, or there's a, a, a thing, a, a theory, I guess is probably the best word, by a fellow by the name of Nassim Taleb. He is, uh, I don't know, he's like an investor, but he also writes a lot of really great books like Black Swan and Anti-Fragile. But he has this thing called the Lindy Effect, 
I don't know if he came up with it, but it's attributed to him that a technology that has lasted for a long time is more likely to last for a long time than a technology that is more recent. Um, so like for instance, um, you know, Facebook has only been around for so long. There's a good chance it's not going to last as long as uh, letter writing has lasted because letter writing has lasted for a very long time and has a deep tradition versus Facebook is so small that even now we're seeing people jump off to different platforms because of uh, how Facebook chooses to run things. So with the great tradition, it's like this stuff has lasted for a long time. That's that is a, a very nice heuristic to say, hey, it's probably going to last for a long time well, so it's worthwhile to do. And um, on top of that, I, I, I hate to use this argument because it's, uh, it's an argument that Charles Spurgeon uses for defending the Bible. But he says, how do you defend the Bible? You defend the Bible like you defend a lion. You let the thing out of the cage. And when it comes... <clears throat> When it comes to the great tradition, you simply do that. Anybody who's spent any time in it should be able to really appreciate just its worthwhileness. There's a, there's a, there's a place here that's hard for us to articulate of why we should care. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's a place where if you just jump into it and you start doing it, you'll begin to get a lot of stuff out of it. And uh, I find it to be very very worthwhile i will say <laughs> um i once was uh, discussing uh the faith with a muslim and they told me um hey if, if you want to really uh know who allah is uh just pray and read the quran and i did that and it did not i read the quran over Christmas break, and it did not manifest itself to me as they told me it would. Um, so, how would you? How how does the great tradition? Um, how could you defend it instead of just letting it out of the cage? Well, the, what I said earlier uh, still stands, though. That, that it's the fact that it's lasted for so long. Um, I think it's that in and of itself lets it stand. Um, but if somebody does come along, like, look, all right, we'll discuss this at some other points, but I do not believe we are all created uh, equal with equal faculties. Um, it may be you start reading it at your, you know, let's say it like a 12 year old comes up to me and says that sort of thing. Well, I, I tried to read Plato. I couldn't understand it. I tried to read. He read like three or four other books. Not be able to, to understand these things quite yet and give it some time. And maybe later you will. But there's some people, too, and this is, this is fine with me, who just won't really be interested in this sort of thing. You know, they'll, they'll be interested in other things uh, as well. And for me, it's like I, I, can't, I can't convince somebody that this is a worthwhile pursuit to do if, um, if they don't have the uh, aptitude for the thing, if they're not you know, just ready to do it. And it may be at a later date they will be. And uh, to me, that's fine. It's not like I have to convince everybody that this is something worthwhile to do. So just like with Christianity, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a point at which you scatter the seed and you hope it takes, but it's not like I'm going to bend over backwards to be like, no, 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 really, man. Like if you would just, if you would, you know, I'm not going to yeah. do that. I, uh, I do think about my where i'm at in my education right now and when i read some people uh like i just got done with a uh tutorial uh, a class on owen barfield it was very difficult honestly the only thing that kept me reading through it was that c.s lewis called owen barfield and i forget what, heck, what he actually calls him but the the greatest of his unofficial teachers and it was like okay if c.s lewis thought owen barfield was this significant he has to be. Now, there were many times I read them and I just wasn't there, but I have to lean on, I guess I call it ancient wisdom. I have to le uh, lean on C.S. Lewis's wisdom to say, okay, there must be something worthwhile in it. Um, so uh, I, I, I see your point now with the, uh, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, 
I see your point with if it's lasted for so long, then it at least warrants our curiosity on why it's lasted so long that it's probably worthwhile. You know, the greatest structures that still exist, there's a reason why they're still existing. Um, so, so look at them. Yeah, it's not so much to convince you that it's good, but to convince you to at least investigate. You know, it's like Pascal's wager. You know, Pascal's wager wasn't designed to get people to believe in Jesus or believe in God, but rather to investigate that, hey, this is worthwhile because if you're right, then, hey, this is you get a huge payoff. But if you're wrong, then it's also like, uh, you know, uh, that's a that's a pretty big deal in and of itself. So it's at least worth investigating that God may or may not exist. And I think the great tradition, that argument still stands with it because it is such a monolithic thing. But hey, it's at least worthwhile uh, to look at. So, uh, but I think we have to do now, though, is be a little more particular as far as it's worthwhile for Christians. But you know, Sam, why, why do you, why did you get into this whole thing in the beginning? You know, why did you start doing? Because I think we both started in different places that led us here. So. How how did you get started with this whole reading the great conversation? Yeah, so um, it's kind of interesting that I'm talking to my brother about this because I I'm, everything I'm about to say you already know, but for you know for the listeners on the podcast, I was not a reader growing up, and I yeah I feel pretty bad about it. Um, not novels, you know. The only thing was like maybe my Honda manual to to build cars. Um, it wasn't until I went to college uh to get my bachelor's uh, i got my bachelor's in biblical studies and reading commentaries and different you know just reading books you see homer plato aristotle augustine aquinas locke kierkegaard you see all of these people being mentioned and then you don't really know who they were you know that they are profound because they're footnoted everywhere and that kind of had me a lot more curious. And then when my, the master's um, work came up, uh, there was an opportunity for me to take a, a distant program um, or, or a distant, it, it was a, a master's in, of associates in Christian and classical studies at Knox Theological Seminary. And that helped me that after reading all these names in the footnotes, I was like, well, I want to be a little bit more um, informed. So I went to that program and it was kind of a uh, synthesis between, you know, biblical studies and philosophy. And uh, that kind of put me in this tradition. And uh, ever since then, I haven't really looked back. Yeah, that's a funny way. Like you started to, to see their impact all over the place. And you're like, oh, man, what about these guys? Um, and then you kind of jumped into it. I think mine was a little bit different the way I started with it. Um, I always knew these books were, I shouldn't say always knew. It sounds like I'm like some destined child to read such things. But I, there's always like this thing in the back of my mind that there are these great classic works that are worthwhile reading, like Jane Austen. And I remember, I remember one year I borrowed uh, Dante's Inferno from a friend over the summer thinking, I, I was probably like 15. I was like, oh, I'm going to read this. And then I'm going to read a bunch of, yeah, I bought it from, uh, I borrowed it from Anna. Um, oh my. Friend of ours. Yeah. So I, I borrowed that and I started reading it and I was like, this is, this is so hard to read. And I thought I was, you know, I had this idea. I'm going to read a bunch of classic books. You know, I'm going to go into Barnes and Noble every other week and buy a new classic, no, uh, classic work and read that. And it just never happened. But it was always like, that was like the beginning of this whole thing. But then later on, uh, I went to went to college, and I, I knew that I also got my degree in biblical studies. I, I knew that there was something outside of just learning how to write uh, an exegesis paper on a particular uh, verse or set of verses or pericope, if you're going that far. Um, I, I knew there was something beyond that. And I knew that um, that the great apologists that I was listening to, like Ravi Zacharias in particular, would bring up ideas from the great thinkers of the time, even people like Oscar Wilde. He would he would talk about, it and I thought there's something here. Um, there's something here in learning about these big ideas 
that helps Christians talk to the world about Christ. And that's why I started it. I, I started more of an apologetics mindset. And I still believe that there's a lot there, but it's bigger than that. And what interests me now in the whole thing is simply just metaphysics and moral education. And I, I there, there's a, what's the right word? There's probably a right word for this, but there's an enjoyment in reading them in and of themselves. And that's intrinsic good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an intrinsic good. There you go. There's an intrinsic good in, in all of this. And that's really why I got started in the whole great conversation. I kind of already started talking about why I've kept there, but I think it's important. There's a lot of things that we start that seem like really good ideas, but later on it's like, no, this is not, this is not great. Um, not at all. Like I remember once I bought a um, workout plan online by some, I, I don't know, <laughs> just some ad or whatever. And like, I looked at the workouts and I thought, oh, here we go. You know, here's this great workout thing. And I, and I did it. And then I started doing more research and then everybody online was like bashing this guy and like doing these really long detail of why this is not good. So yeah, I started it, but I didn't stay with it. So I think it's important for us to discuss. Uh, this is, I've been, I guess in this for about the last three, four years, seriously. So why Sam, are you keep, why are you go, keep, keep going with this? Why in the world are you getting your, your PhD in all of this, you know, what's the point? Yeah. Um, I, I enjoy school. I'll say that I enjoy learning. And this is a subject matter that has constantly produced fruit and I am constantly harvesting. It seems gold, uh, you know, ancient wisdom, the commentary on the good life is something that I'm very interested in. And uh, really, I just I find a lot of enjoyment from it. So while it is difficult, um, there was a time, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, I was reading Owen Barfield for I think three hours. I was pretty frustrated, and I just I called it I called it quits. I you know I went in the kitchen. Me and uh, my wife were talking, and I was just pretty frustrated. But then the next day, you know, I actually I read a, a, a short essay by C.S. Lewis, and it was just really good. And it was talking about, um, I guess, how metaphors are, uh, how, how language is metaphor. But anyways, it was so fascinating. And now I look at language so so much differently. And uh, it's it's those times where it's just like, yeah, Owen Barfield didn't click yesterday, but this clicked. Um, and then I'll I'll read Owen Barfield later on and say, wow, that is that is fascinating. And there are a few things with the, that Owen Barfield says that is uh, genuinely noteworthy. So um, it is difficult. There are many times where it is. Uh, I don't think I'll ever abandon it, but I'll, I may leave an author for a time. But the discussion itself is is about the good life, and that's what I'm interested in, and it helps me. Um, I, I believe that it helps me be a good Christian, um, being able to articulate the Christian worldview, the Christian faith, um, and know why people don't accept it on the other side, because they are, you know, uh, scientific naturalists, or they are romantic naturalists, um, etc. So um, it helps me defend the faith, but also um, it's just fun and I enjoy it. Yeah, I think, I think it's even if itself was worthwhile to say, yeah, I found it, I enjoy it. I think it's great. Uh, for me, I, I keep going at it because I see how much truth there is to it. I, you know, I think, was it Aristotle or Plato even? He talked about the good, the true, and the beautiful, and how they all intersect in great ways. And to take Plato, for instance, um, I, I'm, I, re I listen to a lot of politics. Um, I'm always reading the news and stuff like that. I probably should stop and read more of this stuff, and I do. But uh, when I do that, though, it's like I can just think about all the stuff that's happening in the world and going, oh, here's what Plato said about these sorts of things, and here's what Aristotle would comment upon this idea. And, and uh, this is what Augustine would say to somebody who thought something like this. And what... When I do that, probably not Augustine, because I haven't read a bunch of Augustine. I probably think of like Aquinas, maybe. 
Um, and when I think th think about the world in those ways, it it makes me think, oh wow, like you know, history does not repeat, but it rhymes, and you begin to see patterns in the world as far as how humans interact with one another, and that helps you, in some ways, predict the future and predict. Um, what people are going to act like. You may not be able to predict what a person acts like because that's tough, but like people in general, for some reason, we become very predictable when you look at us on the massive scale of things, which is interesting. So I see value in it in the fact that I just see these ideas just populate everywhere from any sort of article, even like a, a video game review. Um, you're going to find these ideas laced in there. and to know that uh, helps you be able to, to, to think about these things uh, much better. And in a lot of ways, um, uh, you already talked about this, but I think it's called uh, the via negativa or via negativia, however you say it. But basically, you learn about the Bible by reading all the other things around it to realize just how good it is. Um, I think that's also worthwhile in of itself. You read a bunch of books that are good and there's great books here but when you go back to the bible you just you realize that yeah this is something on a completely different category and that's worth pointing out and worth exploring uh even more yeah so what are you uh what are you reading now what are some of the things that you're as part of this conversation i know you do a lot for school and such so so what are you up to now yeah, I, I really don't know when we're going to put out this podcast, um, like uh, send it out. But right now, we're, uh, I am in the middle of semesters. So I just finished up my fall semester. I'm beginning my spring semester. And there's a, there's a paper coming up that I'm going um, to try to uh, get published. But I am right now studying Francis Bacon and... Uh, his specifically his influence on Alexander Campbell. Um, so I'm I'm actually just at the beginning of that uh, research. Actually, right after this recording, I'm going to go to a um, a library and uh, get some books. But other than that, I have for the last maybe two years, I've been interested in Soren Kierkegaard, and my recent papers have kind of been on him. He is. Is a pretty big interest to me. Um, I know yesterday me and Abe were talking, and Abe, you know, our podcast is called the Philosophers and Poets, and Abe said that you know I'm I am the philosopher, and Abe, you're more of the poet. Well, I I really want to become balanced, and I have been interested in uh, Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, and then when I read Soren Kierkegaard, it's a different way of thinking, and it's yeah, it is very poetic and imaginative. And I I hope that Soren Kierkegaard is going to help balance my mental faculties out to where I can be analytical when I need to be, but also uh, I can uh, imagine. You know, he he loved myth, he loved stories, and. He he yeah. could uh, suffer. So um, I hope Soren Kierkegaard balances me out. I'm reading a book by C.S. Lewis called The Screwtape Letters, in which there's an elder demon named Wormwood is talking to his nephew called Screwtape. And he basically talks to Screwtape to teach him how to influence a human to be sinful and stay away from the enemy, which is God. Uh, so it's, it's a great work on sin. And uh, you really have to be a devil yourself to know how to write a sort of book, but that's what makes good men is those who know how to do the, know how to do wrong or do evil or be, you know, strong and powerful, but they choose to be good instead. That's, I think it's, that's the idea behind meekness is that you have the ability to be strong and powerful, but you choose to, to not be. Um, so I've been reading that. I'm trying to think of some of the other books that I've written recently. I've recently read um, Franz Kafka, The Trial, which was a very wild read. Um, and I, I enjoyed that. I I read some of the commentary on it, and it was just super fascinating um, about how he, the whole thing is, is it's a great, it's a great book. It's about a man who's on trial and he doesn't know why he's on trial. He doesn't even know like 
who this shadow government even is. And so he has these questions, but he doesn't want to like bring himself to uh, admit that he's done wrong, even though everybody in there, if you admit you're guilty, it goes a lot easier for you, but he doesn't want to admit he's guilty. So it's a great book. Um, it's a wild book, but Kafka writes that way. So cool. It's worthwhile. I've never right. read Kafka. Yeah, well, you should, I think. Yeah, one uh, day. It's, it's a, I may. It, yeah, it's, yeah, you've got a lot of books to read, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I probably should read Barfield, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you want to read Barfield, I would suggest reading uh, first Poetic Diction and then secondly Saving the Appearances. Those are probably his most difficult works, but I think that those really his whole uh, – all of his books really are different variations on the same theme of the evolution of consciousness. So we've had to read maybe eight of his books, but they're all about that. So I think poetic diction and saving the appearances would be uh, um, helpful and uh, to stick with it. <laughs> Interesting. Well, maybe at some point, but if we we're going to have other people jump into the great conversation, we probably wouldn't want them to start reading Barfield. Um, where do you think would be a good place to start if somebody was like, yeah, this does sound like an interesting idea, but this is worthwhile. Where where would I go? You know, where would you have people start? The philosopher in me would say, start at Plato's Republic. Um, I would, I would say probably start there, um, with Mordman Adler and, uh, in his published series, the great books of the Western world. But as a poet, I would say start wherever you're you're curious about. Start where your passion is, and I I would honestly recommend you start with your passion. I, you know, uh, I'm a runner, and people ask me when they start running, "Hey, um, you know, what shoes should I get, and and wh- how how should my form be, and what should my training plan look like?" And these are all good questions to have and try to approach running in a very scientific and disciplined way. But I also think that there's something about just enjoying running and getting out there and just don't worry about your form. Don't worry about how far you're going to go. Don't worry about what your pace is. Just enjoy it. And I think after you enjoy it for some time, you reap some benefits. Um, Then maybe you could start with Plato's Republic. I think there's something to be said about following the great conversation chronologically. You know, anytime you watch a movie, I think it's good to start at the beginning. Anytime you listen to a conversation, I think it's good to start at the beginning of the conversation. Um, and I guess even before then, we could talk about the Old Testament or Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. But um, I would say the Plato's Republic is a good place to start. But if you're not sure about the great tradition, if, if you've never read anything and you're really curious about Soren Kierkegaard, I would say start with Soren Kierkegaard, even though he'd be a a very difficult person to start with. Um, so uh, I would say just who are you curious about? Read about um, or read that person. And then after, uh, after you know, maybe a year, start going chronologically through uh, the, the great tradition. What about you, Abe? Where would you recommend people start? Yeah, I, in some ways I would say start where I started, which would be um, this uh, lecture series by Dr. Warren Gage, who used to teach at Knox, but he no longer does. Um, the podcast is still there, and I'll put it in the show notes if it's still available. Um, they may clean it up at some point and, and, and remove it, but there's several of the uh, uh, podcast, several of the lecture series from Knox Theological Seminary where we both got our, well, Sam finished his master's. I, I started mine, but I, I didn't finish. Um, and that that's a good place to start because um, – it's hard to know because what was tough for me reading Dante's Inferno by myself when I was like you know 15 or so for the first time um, was that I didn't know what I was reading and it was really tough and I probably felt a lot like uh, the eunuch um, the Ethiopian eunuch on the way back to uh, Ethiopia where Philip comes up to him and explains to him he's reading Isaiah and I think you need some sort of teacher in the beginning not that you just rely on teachers the whole time but a few places to begin there would be, I do really enjoy Mortimer Adler's How to Think About Great Ideas book. It's basically this pretty big book with a bunch of like bite-sized essays about how to think about justice, 
how to think about God, how to think about ideas, how to think about uh, morality. And they're really short essays, and they're almost in like a conversation back and forth between him and I think Van Doren. So that would be another place to begin. But like Sam was saying, any place you're interested in, like jump into it, you know. Um, but starting in the beginning with the Republic, and that's what those, uh, that's what that lecture series is on, helps you to realize what categories are at work whenever these things are being discussed. And even if an author just d- goes away with those categories, it's helpful to know that he's doing that. And Plato, what I think Plato does in his Republic, sets up the categories that most of the conversation is about. And that's why I think you should start there. Now, Aristotle, even himself, he'll go on and develop those even further, and he'll just write different books on the different topics. But Plato's Republic kind of covers everything in and of itself. And so that would be good. And I would recommend you get the Alan Bloom translation. That's the best one that I've read. And reading the interpretive essay at the end of the book before you read it. So that way, even if you disagree with Alan Bloom's understanding of Plato, which you can do that, um, he helps you kind of go, here's the groundwork that's being laid, and here's how he's going to do it. And then when you read it, you go, oh, that's what's going on here. To me, that's always really helpful, is to know what exactly I'm reading before I read it. So yeah, I guess I would to be... say start there. Not just to be contrary, but I think that this is actually, um, I guess I believe this. I think there's a reason why Alan Bloom's essays at the back. I think that there are reasons why, you know, we introductions can be helpful. I think before you do that, I think it's better to read the book, them, the book itself, or at least the first few books, because that you're going to come away and you're going to say, I don't know what I just read. I am so discouraged. You know, Sam and Abe's podcast was helpful. It was encouraging, but this is just not what I'm interested in. It's at that point you're ready to learn. And then you can go to the interpretive essay. Then you can go to the introduction and then you can learn a little bit more. But it's when you get frustrated and you're very, um, I guess, ignorant hopefully still curious, that's when you're ready to learn. And I think it's important to go to the text itself first in order to build up the curiosity um, in order to, to glean uh, from, from others. Yeah, I, I struggle with that because, um, I, I, and I've done that though. I mean, I've done that where I've just read through the thing first before I had an interpretive essay, like with the trial. Like I thought that was just a crazy book to read. And I was like, I don't, why do people like this book? It's interesting for sure. It's suspenseful and I like that. But I didn't really get a lot out of it. But then I read a few, uh, yeah, I read a few interpretive essays and a few uh, interviews of people who've studied the book more. And then I go, oh, wow, that was in there. Wow, that was, he was doing that with dogs. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and that helped to do that. So I guess I think you can go either way. But I see, I see your allegory of the cave in that we have to go back to the pure form of the thing rather than looking at the shadows of the commentary on the thing. And yeah, I, well, I, I, yeah. One day we'll probably uh, maybe do a cave episode and explain that. Um, well, yeah, it's a pretty famous thing. Yeah. But a lot, yeah, a lot go of look it up don't... if you're not sure about the allegory of the cave, but it's also about, it's all about getting back to the form of the thing and not so much the obfuscation of commentaries of the thing, um, but the thing itself, but that's probably so, too simplistic. Yeah. But. In the the Faulkner program, they put a pretty big emphasis on not reading um, introductions first, or at least reading a very short introduction, and only spending maybe four minutes of your time knowing, you know, what is the book about, and then jumping into it. Because, let's say with the Plato's Republic, if you go read Alan Bloom's interpretive essay, uh, you may not. And what if his essay's wrong? What if it, it, he doesn't interpret uh, the Republic properly? You will probably only read his uh, his interpretation as you read it. Um, but if you read it, you know, with uh, you know tabula rasa with, with a blank slate, then you may um, see things that he didn't see before. Now his interpretation may complement yours. Um, or yours might just steamroll his, you know, 
But um, anyways, I think there's something to be said about a short introduction and try to try to answer your own questions as you read it. Yeah, that's probably a healthy, a very healthy thing to do. A short introduction and then jump into it. Yeah. The interpretive essay is pretty long and it's pretty exhaustive. I guess what I do is when I read stuff like that, I think, all right, now prove it. You know, you read, you wrote your essay, you've interpreted the thing. Now let's, let's see if you're right. And then I'll go read the book and I'll try to like, think about what he said. Is that really true? You know, does he really think this is what Plato is doing? Is he really being sarcastic about the first city or is he not being sarcastic? Um, so I, I think that's, I, yeah, I think there's a balance there. But the, the main purpose of an introduction is not to explain the whole thing before you actually read it, but just to give you the groundwork as far as here's where we're going. So, um, But here's one more other thing you can do to get and jump into the conversation, which is against introductions, is you can subscribe to this podcast. We would very much appreciate it. We're going to be putting a podcast out every week on different ideas. I think what we got next week is lined up is a schedule between the philosopher and and the poet, and those two different ways of thinking about the world and how uh, we can be more philosophic in our thinking and we can be more poetic in our thinking. That'll be a, a worthwhile discussion and something I think about just about all the time. Uh, so it'll be a good discussion. And we want to thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. Um, and we will see you guys in the next podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Ha <laughs> <laughs>